now as we prepare for the reading of your word, I ask that you bless the reading of your word. Take it to the hearts and minds you have it reach. And Father, I pray that I get it right. In Jesus' precious and holy name, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I want to begin this week with a disclaimer. This is similar to the one that I gave last year during our series on 1 Timothy. When I preach a series, it is different because I am preaching scripture word for word, verse by verse, from greeting to beginning. When I do it that way, not every scripture will have to do with us as a church. Some scriptures may be for the future. Some may be to help us with our past. One may be life-changing for some and of less value to others. While we know all scripture is profitable, not all scripture is for each of us at the exact same moment. I say that because in a series, I deal with what the scripture says, and so I don't want you to think that I am necessarily preaching about an issue that we as a church are dealing with. Or that I think people in the church are struggling with. For instance, when I say Christians should want to come to church, it is wintertime in Montana. Many in our church are, are sick or injured or even recovering from surgery. If you can't come to church because of illness or fear of illness, that's just fine. What I'm talking about is this. There are many people in this world, many of whom are in this room, who hate to miss church. I know because you send me notes and letters when you're unable to attend. So I know many of you who miss church and it makes you feel terrible. You wish that you could have been here and you feel awful when you can't be. That is normal. What the scripture from last week is talking about are the people in the world who not only don't hate to miss church, they hate to get up and go in the first place. Again, I get the calls and notes. So I know how much the members of this church hate to miss service. And that is important to understand as we cover an entire book of the Bible. Not every verse is for everyone at this exact day and this exact time. My scripture today comes from 2 Timothy chapter 2, and I'll read verses 7 through 14. This is from the King James Version. Consider what I say, and the Lord give thee understanding in all things. Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel, wherein I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even unto bonds. But the word of God is not bound. Therefore I endure all things for the elect's sakes, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. It is a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. Of these things put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord, that they strive not about words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. So we begin in verse 7 which kind of jumps in where we left off last week. Consider what I say, and the Lord give thee understanding in all things. In the four verses before this, Paul tells Timothy 
much of what I have said this morning already. Run the race to win. Don't settle for second best. A real good example of that is with your kid's education. When I was in school, you needed a 65% or higher proficiency in a subject before they would pass you. 65 to 70% was a D, and at that time, it was good enough. I don't know what it is today, but no parent in the history of education has ever told their child, 65 is passing, so don't work yourself to death. You should shoot for that D. We expect our kids to shoot for A's and B's. Now, if you have a kid, like my dad did, who gets D after D after D in English, and you know that is the best he has. You see him try and try and try, and you know he's really trying. Those Ds are okay. My last college course that I took for fun two summers ago, I got a B in it. And the professor told me if I could spell and punctuate properly, it would have been an A. So I'm still failing English. But if you have an honor student who is making Ds because they are lazy and they want to scrape by, no parent in America will tolerate that. Paul is telling Timothy, you are capable of A's and B's. I should not see D's on your report card. Think about that one throughout this week. Live your Christianity like you're a kid who wants an A. Remember when you were a kid and you wanted something really bad and your parents told you to bring a grade up from a C to an A or whatever the case was and maybe you studied and tried for that grade because of whatever it was you were after. Take the next week, just one week out of your life, and live your life for God like you want that A. Attack your faith like you want that gold star they used to give us all in grade school. Live it for a week and see where it takes you. Often I hear people say that the most important thing a Christian can do as a witness is to live their life. People say, I just let my light shine. But who are you shining it to? There are monks in France who never, ever, ever leave the church. They sit in prayer all day. They fast regularly. They are prayer warriors. And I love prayer warriors. We talked about this a few weeks ago in Bible study. You always know the people who are prayer warriors. People you can take a request to. And they will pray about it sometimes right then at that moment. But these monks, they never see anyone. They are, there are 168 hours in a week. If you spend 167 of those hours in your house and one hour a week leaving your house to check the mail, you're not really light shining. You're kind of hid under a bushel. Now, I know not everybody gets out and runs all over the place. So if you're a homebody, that's fine. Be one of the prayer warriors. You can shoot for A's in your Christian life by praying for the people who are out there every day. I don't just mean preachers. Pray for local and state law enforcement. Pray for the kids that are in our military. We call them the brave men and women, and that's what the military turns them into. But when they first leave home, and step on that bus, they are still children willing to offer their lives for our freedom. Here's a fun game. Every day, pick one politician that you really don't care for and pray for 10 minutes that that person is led by God to do good things for our country. 
If you look around and there is no one for you to shine your light to, pray for the people who have a light to shine in our community. And then the Holy Spirit will start poking at them and they look at things from a more godly perspective. For one week, try and be an A student for the Lord and you will see God actively work in your life. Verse 8, remember that Jesus Christ, the seed of David, was raised from the dead according to my gospel. In the original writing, this comes across very much like a pledge, something that was to be recited and memorized. Jesus Christ, the seed of David, was raised from the dead. When Paul says, according to my gospel, he is reiterating what he said in verse 2 of the same chapter. And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Paul is putting a stamp on his words. This is what I have said. This is what you have heard me say. This is the good news that I have proclaimed. The next few verses are truly something beautiful. Verse 9, wherein I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even unto bonds, but the word of God is not bound. The use of the word of God here is awesome because it's threefold. In John chapter 1, verse 1, we read, In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things that were made by him and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in darkness, and the darkness overcame it not. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness, to bear witness of the light, that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light that lights every man that comes into the world. He was in the world, and the world was not made, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the children of God, even to them that believe on his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So Jesus is the word of God that is not bound. Also, the words that God has had meant to record as scripture. That is the word of God. Malachi 3, 6. For I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore, ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. So God's written word will not be contained. That is evidenced in China and other places where the government says the scripture in written form is forbidden. And the people, they will get one book, like the book of Matthew, and whole villages will commit the book, the entire book, to memory. Then the third illustration is in Jeremiah 26, 5. To hearken to the words of my servants, the prophets, whom I sent unto you, both rising up early and sending them, but ye have not hearkened. God's word as it is shared by his ministers. How do you know a minister is preaching the good stuff? He is preaching God's word. Because the three will line up. If scripture says it, Jesus says it in scripture, and a preacher preaches it, the way it is in Scripture and according to the words of Christ. Like it or not, that is God's word. Wherein I suffer trouble. Paul is talking about his gospel from verse 8. Because of the gospel, my gospel, what Paul is preaching, I suffer trouble as an evildoer. Not that Paul has done an evil, but he is being treated that way even unto bonds. They have treated me like an evildoer all the way up to imprisonment. When I preach something and I know that I am preaching the gospel, my gospel, what God has given me, 
in his word. I am always shocked when people think they can call me ignorant or they can throw tantrums like a child and they expect me to acquiesce, acquiesce by definition, to accept, comply, or submit tactily or passively. I will not acquiesce to their way of thinking. You're welcome to ask my children. The tantrums of a three-year-old do not dissuade me. I will not be the preacher who builds anyone a golden calf. I don't care how many tantrums they throw. And the reason why? The reason Paul is ready, willing, and able to die for Jesus, the Christ, the seed of David, verse 9, but the word of God is not bound. Remember when we talked in 1 Timothy about the joy Paul shows at his ability to share the gospel even from jail. Here we see that again. He knows, Paul knows, that they can only kill his earthly body once. Kim Jong-un can only blow me up once. And when I wake up, I get to live forever in an undestructible body. Every year, thousands of people go to what they call cosplay events so they can dress up and pretend to be superheroes. We are all real superheroes. I am immortal and I'm not pretending to be. God has guaranteed it. Think of this, we spend so much time in fear for our family, in fear for the future, in fear for the country, in fear for your family or the people around you. If you are so scared about the future of the country and of your family or the people around you, teach them to live forever. Make sure Jesus is their Savior and He is the King that they bow down to daily. That is the attitude that has Paul rejoicing in this little hole in the ground. The Word of God is not bound. Then verse 10, Therefore I endure all these things for the elect's sakes, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. The next few verses have a ton of scripture references, and I'm just going to beat them like a drum this morning. A couple of weeks ago, I pointed out that just like Paul Newman in Cool Hand Luke, at this moment, the Apostle Paul has his mind right. He is willing to endure whatever he must for the sake of the people who will hear the gospel in the future. He's not only talking the talk of being godly, he is walking the walk. John 15, 9. As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. This is my commandment, that ye love one another as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Paul is ready to give his life, and he does, for the elect's sake, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. The next few verses are repeated over and over again in Scripture. Verse 11 <coughs> It is a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. Uh, Galatians, in Galatians 2.20, Paul says it this way, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself up for me. In Philippians 1, Paul writes it this way, verse 21, For, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. But if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. Yet what shall I choose, I want not. For I am in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. 
And having this confidence, I know that I shall abide and continue with you for all your furtherance and joy of faith, that your rejoicing may be more abundant in Jesus Christ for me by my coming to you again. Nothing you ever do or achieve in life will mean more than your salvation. Jesus is the highest authority. 2 Timothy 2, verse 12. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. This scripture is repeated in Matthew 10, 32. Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. And in Luke 12, 8, also I say unto you, whosoever shall confess me before men, him shall the Son of Man also confess before the angels of God. But he who denieth me before men shall be denied before the angels of God. We see the circular flow of Scripture. We see how God repeats over and again what it is he wants from us, how we are to treat him first, and then how we're to treat each other. To me, that's always a very comforting thing. Verse 13, if we believe not, yet he abideth faithfully, he cannot deny himself. This one is everywhere too. Revelation 3.20 says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. John 19.28 reads, After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst. Now there was set a vessel full of vinegar, and they filled a sponge with vinegar, and put it upon a hyssop, and put it upon his mouth. When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. Jesus has done his part. When he hung on the cross and died for our sins and arose on the third day, all things were now accomplished. It is finished. Your debt is paid. Jesus abideth faithfully. He cannot deny himself. But if we believe not, verse 12 and all the others say, he will most certainly deny us. Verse 14. Of these things put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord that they strive, not about words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. Paul is saying, remind the Christians, the elect, the saints, of all these things, charge them before the Lord, make sure they know the importance of the gospel, and that they strive. There is that word again, strive. That they strive not about words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. That means if you have a friend who's not saved, your every conversation should be about Jesus. Synonyms for subvert. Destabilize, unsettle, overthrow, overturn, bring down, topple, depose, oust, disrupt, wreak havoc on. Sabotage, ruin, undermine, weaken. Does that sound like the way you share the gospel? People say, I just don't think the gospel should be spread that forcefully. If the words and the methods that you are using to bring people to Christ aren't bringing people to Christ, maybe, just maybe, you need to try some new words and some new methods. If you are not speaking godly words that subvert the people who hear them, you are striving for words of no profit. People ask, why does it matter, Jim? They won't listen to me, Jim. Not everybody is good at talking to people, Jim. We all have different gifts, Jim. But we all have the same command from Jesus. Matthew 28, 18. And Jesus came and spoke unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye, therefore, and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, 
teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. That is the goal of our church, and the moment that stops, we run the risk of becoming a social club. Guys, I'm going to stop there for this morning, and I thank you for listening to me.